Hello and welcome to Harry's Jetty Clinic. I've got a lot of videos on YouTube about how to do a variety of things in Jetty and they tend to get more and more complex as people are looking to achieve complex things. But I thought I'd do a series for people who are absolutely new to the Jetty system. For instance, friends of mine have recently bought uh, Jetties and I've helped them get going. And a lot of people ask uh, questions because they're perhaps confused by the Jetty literature or Jetty's instruction manual. Um, in many cases seems to be designed to confuse people. So I thought we'd take a look at what to do when you've got your Jetty out of the box and you're ready to play with it. Of course, dive in and have a good play around and have a look. There's nothing like that new novelty value. Um, but then perhaps come back here and see just how to really configure things. This series is not going to be about programming. There's plenty of my videos about that. This is about configuring the system to be correct in the first place. If you're an experienced Jetty user, it might well be worth watching because the number of uh, people I know who've had Jetty for years and they ask me for a bit of help on something and I, I whiz through a menu at tremendous speed and they do something and say, stop, stop, how did you do that? And I show them the shortcut to do something and they, they go, oh, I wish I'd known that years ago. So you never know what you might pick up. Or, indeed, you might spot that I'm doing something a slow way and let me know there's a better way. First of all, let's get the legals out of the way. I am not official Jetty information. I'm not sponsored, paid. Uh, Jetty does not check these videos for correctness. So what you are getting is one user's opinion of how to go about it. Okie dokie. Uh, if, if somebody else gives you a different opinion, fine. If Jetty tells you to do it a different way, go with what Jetty say, because they are official. I am not. Right, we've got the legals out of the way. Okay, um, first things first, I'm going to talk about the screen misting up. I don't know if it happens with the colour screens, but it comes up time to time on internet forums, or people ask me, help, my screen has missed it up like a car windscreen on a damp morning. Uh, it's faulty, it's wrong, what should I do? Um, well, maybe technically it's faulty, but it's normal for Jetty, certainly on the black and white screens. Uh, mine does it if I go out on a sunny day. And yes, one or two days a year in Britain, we do get sunny days. And if I have the transmitter sitting out in the open with the screen facing towards the sun and it's getting direct sunlight on it, within half an hour, it's a big patch of misted up. And by the end of an hour, it's evaporated away and gone. It's been doing it for years. Other people get it. It never seems to cause any damage or harm. So, as I say, it's normal for Jetty. Don't panic. Okie dokie. Now, if you've bought uh, your, your Jetty, you could have bought it brand new, or you might have bought it second hand. Or you might have, you know, been a Jetty user for a while, and you've just bought a second hand item, such as a second hand receiver. If you've bought stuff second hand, the first thing I'm going to suggest you do is do a factory reset on it. Unfortunately, I've never found a factory reset option on the transmitter. So you're just going to have to go through. And believe you me, if you've bought second hand, the previous owner could have done some weird things in the system configuration, which cause you all sorts of head scratching as bonkers alarms go off at the maddest of times. And nothing related to what you're doing. Uh, however, the onboard devices, such as the receivers, can be factory reset. And you think, what the heck could he have done in a receiver? Well, Inactivity alarm. thank you. That's one of the system configurations. Uh, they could have remapped the servo output. So whereas you're expecting channel 1 to come out of socket 1 and channel 2 to come out of socket 2, they could have remapped way up to like channel 16 is coming out and your receiver appears not to work or channels are all coming out the wrong place and you get thoroughly confused, just, please just do a factory reset, at least try and check things over. To do a factory reset on a device, you press the menu button to go into menu, go into model, go to device explorer. Now you can scroll down the page the long way if you want, 
or if you just do one anti-clockwise turn of the button, it goes to the bottom of the menu and you're straight there. So with your receiver bound and switched on, you go into the receiver and there's a reset to factory defaults. So get your second hand equipment at least back to that. Okie dokie. Oh, one other thing I should mention. You'll be thinking, what is that? Uh, oh, I don't want configuration. See, even I get myself confused sometimes. Move backwards in the menu too early. You go into Device Explorer, you're always going to see this thing, RC Switch. Now, I haven't got an RC Switch. What is RC Switch? Why is it there? What, what have I done wrong? Why is it showing up? It always shows in Device Explorer. Always. Even if you don't have one, even if you've never had one, even if you don't know what it is. But what it is, is Jetty sells a radio-controlled on-off switch for your model. So that instead of having to go to the model and move the switch on or off for your receiver or use the magnet or whatever on-off switch you have, you can actually do it from one of the switches on the transmitter. And there's an RC switch as a device you fit. Uh, and it's always there in Device Explorer. So if you don't have an RC switch, don't know what it is, don't worry. You don't have to do anything with it. It is always just there. And the next thing to do with your system is get the firmware up to date. You need to make sure the transmitter firmware is up to date and that all your onboard devices, that's your receivers and sensors, are also up to date. Particularly if you've bought second hand, you want to make sure it's up to date. But even if you've just bought brand new, it's arrived in the post or you've rushed home from the shop with it, Jetty does release uh, updates from time to time. Uh, and often very, very useful updates. They're not just little bug fixes, but they can often contain massive uh, increases in functionality or, or improvements to the menus. And in the few weeks between it being uh, built in the factory and getting through the distribution chain and sitting in the shop and you buying it, there could well have been a firmware update. Now, I have separate videos on my YouTube channel, one about how to update the transmitter, one about how to update the onboard devices. So when you need to learn how to update, go and look at those and it shows you what to do. Okie dokie. Um, next, you might find some instructions referring to the F1 to F5 buttons or me talking about it. That's these buttons here, the silver ones below the screen. That's F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. Okie doke. And sometimes you need to press those to confirm what comes up in the box above the button in the menu. And since this one takes you into just basic tools, which deals with volumes and screen contrast. Kidok, that's what those are. Now, let's get your transmitter properly set up and configured. For that, you press the menu button, scroll down the long way or do one click in reverse to get to system. Press the scroll button. Press it again to go into configuration. This is where you can choose your language. Press the button and the drop down box opens. I've deleted all the other languages on my memory card, so that English is the only one remaining. That's why it's only offering me English. Let's say OK to that. Username, you don't have to give it a name, it makes no difference to anything. Stick mode, uh, that's where you choose, you know, are you a mode one, two, three, four, flyer, or whatever. Sound profile. I would suggest you definitely want beep and voice. The choices are quiet, which sometimes might be nice, beep only, in which case uh, you won't get any of the spoken stuff, like the timers won't speak to you when they're counting down. Beep and voice, voice only. I would say beep and voice. Sometimes it means why, why have only voice, why have only beep when both of them can be available. Okie dokie. Date. It's very important that the date is set correctly. Not for the functioning of the system. It won't care if the date's wrong. It's not going to throw a wobbly because it's found some satellite uh, data on your GPS that says something different. Where this really matters is that when you're logging data, telemetry data, such as, you know, receiver voltage and the uh, signal strength, and it's very important to do this, to check after maiden flights of a model that, you know, your aerial positionings are all working well and that the, this receiver is really getting good quality data. 
uh, and that your battery or your battery eliminator circuit, the BEC, your speed controller, isn't having dropouts and low voltages. And when the transmitter creates the file with all the log data from that flight, it will name it with the date and the time. And so when you go back to look for it later, and you think, okay, this is the 19th of May, 2020. Okay, so I'll look at the file named 19th of May, 2020 at 9.55. It's not there. Well, it is there, but it's named with whatever date is in here. So if that says the 7th of February, 2015, that's what it's going to be called. And, uh of course, you don't think, oh, I'll go and look in here and look at the date and I'll use that to find the file. People just go, oh, it hasn't logged it. Well, it has. So that's why it's important that the date is correct. Otherwise, you'll really struggle to find your data logging files. Time is less so important, but it's again, it's useful because if you've just had a flight, you know that the uh, file named 19th of May 2020, 956, is the one you're looking for rather than some other weird time. And then you can come down, choose what distance units you want, temperature units, transmit frequency. Press the uh, programming dial here and rotate it to see what the choices are. You can have 50 hertz or you can have 100 hertz. I would suggest you always want 100 hertz. And the first thing you're thinking of is, no, Harry, I'm using old analog servos. They should only get a signal at 50 hertz or 20 milliseconds, because there's 50, 20 milliseconds in a second, yeah? That's not what this is dealing with. This is dealing with the transmission rate of packets from the transmitter to the receiver. The actual servo frame rate is set in the receiver. So why would you want to transmit 50 packets a second to the receiver when you can transmit 100? If you're transmitting 100, Every second one could get knocked out and corrupted. You'd still get 50 packets a second arriving at the receiver. So you've got much better redundancy here. So that's why I would suggest always set it at 100 hertz. And don't worry, because in the receiver, you set the servo output rate, where you could set it to be 20 milliseconds for analog servos or faster for digital servos. Okie doke. Disable the startup question. I would say, no, don't disable it. It can be useful. Reverse menu navigation. I think that's that bit where I can scroll backwards and you get to the top of the, a menu. You keep scrolling backwards. It jumps to the bottom of the menu. Oh, no, that's that one, is it? Rolling menu up and down. So reverse menu navigation. I don't know. A screenshot capture switch. You can assign a switch here. And when you move the switch, it will take a digital screenshot, a photo in effect, of the screen, uh, which can be very useful if you're trying to post written instructions, uh, for instance, on a web forum, Facebook or whatever, rather than taking a photo of the screen and all the problems, as you can see with reflections and lights and stuff, you get a true screenshot for that. Uh, the PPM con settings, there is inside the transmitter, you have to take the back case off to get to it. But on one of the boards is a PPM connector, uh, which you can plug in a little cable to. And this would be for things like flight simulators, um, possibly a buddy box. We're not sure. I'm still trialing that. But of course, there isn't an output socket somewhere here. So you have to buy uh, a jetty cable with a, a jack plug on the end of it and the little connector that plugs in. And then... You're going to have to drill a hole in the case or remove one of your switches to use the hole there as the output for the jack socket. Um, but anyway, that's what the PPM connector settings are. It's working on that. Very rare that you would use those. Check signal before flight. Yes, why would you not want that? Keep going and you're back to the top. What's this little symbol here? It looks like a boat with a couple of masks. It's masts. It's actually meant to represent you looking at your transmitter from the bottom edge. And there's the stick sticking up. Press that and it just confirms the stick mode that you're in. It will be applied only to new models. And you could press the buttons F1 to F4 here to change it. Obviously, I'm a, a mode 2 flyer. Say OK to that. But it was confirmed down here in stick mode anyway. And that's it for 
the system configuration. We'll stop there for a moment uh, because this video has reached, what, 15 minutes? And we'll come back and look at other configuration options in episode two.